I'm Gustavo Fernandes. I'm a medical oncologist at, at Hospital Ser Libanese in Brasilia, Brazil. Uh, I'm Tom Nealon. I'm a cardio oncology doctor. I work at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Gustavo, uh, thanks for agreeing to interview with us. Uh, the, uh, can I ask you, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you, but the first one I wanted to ask you, where do you see the future of immuno-oncology and where do you see that going? That's a tough question. Uh, but uh, immune oncology is, uh, trials are everywhere and indications are popping up like all, all over the place. So uh, about seven years ago when we started to use uh, the first approved uh, immunotherapy, like 1% of the patients had indication for uh, immunotherapy. Now like more than 40% of the patients. So the future of immunotherapy is huge uh, for sure. And this is the quickest transformation we are having in cancer care ever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think everything in the future as you uh, presented is uh, gonna be about immunotherapy. Another question that I, I commonly get asked when I see a pa patient who ha may have toxicity related to the immune therapies, I get asked this question about, will the intervention for the toxicity, which is the use of prednisone or stero corticosteroids, will that affect the cancer outcomes? Uh, so it's a uh, very, very interesting question. This intrigues uh, ourselves too. The body of evidence uh, is too a little bit uh, small. But uh, what we used to decide in, in clinical practice is not to use uh, steroids very liberally, but when it's clinically indicated, uh, we, we, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, we are more fearless to use uh, uh, steroids with modern immunotherapy than we were in the past when we treated patients with inter interleukin and interferon, where the actually the immune effect was very low mm. and we really finished it with uh, some steroids. Now we think that there are very, uh, uh, the, the effect of steroid cannot block everything, but I think in my opinion for sure, we, we should avoid in, in a safe way uh, as, uh, as long as it's possible. And uh, Tom, uh, we, I've seen your wonderful presentation and uh, you showed us a case where there was very tiny uh, clinical evidence of, of uh, heart damage clinically, but the biopsy came up very, uh, with very, very strong findings. Um, how, how do you think we can screen the, the patients to avoid the, 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 like the patients go very quick into a myocarditis or, or something that very, very uh, yeah. severe? Great question. Uh, something I've wrestled with and the community is wrestling with a lot. I would say I think of it in two separate ways. I would think of screening and surveillance. I think from a screening perspective, the only approaches to screening right now which make sense to me are the use of an EKG and a serum troponin at baseline. A couple of reasons for this. They're widely available and they're relatively cheap compared to some of our other cardiac tests. People have spo spoken about the use of echocardiography for screening, measurement of ejection fraction. I don't, think, I don't think that that's a useful approach because more than half the cases who present have a preserved ejection fraction. So right now I would say for screening EKG and troponin, I would ask for, at, for most at baseline. Whether you do surveillance is the real million dollar question. I think there are advantages to, the pros of doing surveillance is are the fact that the disease presents early. So you don't have typically have to do s consider doing surveillance for a long period. The con of doing surveillance is that we really have no idea what is a good test that's accurate, that's, that is reasonably cheap that we can apply to surveillance. One of the issues we, I think about with troponin, for example, in isolation with surveillance is that there may be, some, there may be a lot of false positives especially with very highly sensitive troponins, which will lead to a lot of unnecessary testing, a lot of concern about could this be toxicity. So to summarize, I would say for, sur for screening purposes, EKG and troponin, absolutely, and everyone at baseline. For surveillance, I don't think we're there yet. And, and clinically focus on early evaluation of the symptoms, yes? Uh, clinically, you know, I, if I was doing surveillance if I was considering surveillance, I would probably do surveillance in, I would start by doing a study where you do surveillance in people who may be at higher risk, such as combination immune therapy. And if you could provide, if you could prove that there is value to that approach in combination immune therapy, where the 
prevalence where the incidence of myocarditis is higher then maybe you'd think about it extending it but at the moment we're looking at you know we're looking at incidence rates which are one percent or less so it's very difficult to show that an approach is going to provide value without without providing harm perfect and uh, as a final question uh, we we see now patients on immunotherapy for five years six years and this is going to be a reality like 14 percent of all cancers have great responses to uh, immunotherapy and we're going to see those patients for a uh, long uh, interval so um, how do you feel like about the uh, chronic uh, problems with immunotherapy and cardiovascular I mean it is the great unknown I would say that consistent basic science data suggests that all of the checkpoints which are which are key regulators of cancer response, CTLA-4, PD-1, PDL one are also key regulators of, Im uh, of immune activation and inflammation. And we've known in cardiology for many decades that immune activation and inflammation are critical drivers of atherosclerosis. We don't have any data yet, but it would be very reasonable to hypothesize, especially in the chronic survivors, of which the group is growing dramatically that immune activation will lead to increased inflammation, accelerated atherosclerosis, and increased risk of cardiovascular events. And that myocarditis is just the tip of the iceberg, whereas the real iceberg here is likely atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, too.